Hey! Hello and welcome to Autocrat. I am Vince. I am Cassie and we are your host for today. Yes, and this is episode two, The Fight Against Time. Ooh. Now, do you remember anything we talked about last week and what we might be talking about today? Last week we talked about how it all began when chaos appeared and the insane amount of cross sleeping together to make new gods. That was something. And that, um, oh, and that Kronos was swallowing all of his kids, but then they got freed, and yeah, that's going to be a big fight, a big rebellion, I'm guessing. Exactly, and that's what we'll be covering today, a war in heaven, if you will, otherwise known as the Titanomachy, the fight between Zeus and Kronos, father against son, it's going to be dramatic. Yeah. Now, a quick note here. I've been calling this person Kronos or Cronus at different times during the last episode, and this was because I stumbled across the fact that sometimes Kronos, the personification of time, is seen as a different person, or god I suppose, to the titan Cronus. However, we're going to be following the tradition of people like Stephen Fry and his retelling Mythos, and say that they are in fact the same individuals. So we're saying that Kronos is time? Yes. Kronos and Kronos, there's no distinction, they mean the same individual, the father of Zeus. Okay. The editor of my version of the Theogony, so from the 1700s, says that John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, took inspiration from the Titanomachy, so I thought it might be interesting to give a bit of a summary of what Milton actually talks about in his work. This comparison with Paradise Lost does make some sense because there is, after all, going to be a war in heaven and the losers will, spoiler alert, be thrown down from a high place to a low place afterwards. One interesting note which I found in Paradise Lost when I was struggling my way through it was that I think gunpowder is actually used at some point by the forces of hell against the forces of heaven. It's said to be a substance far away from heaven's light, and I think, from what I remember, or read back over, because it's been a long time since I've read it properly, something like cannons is actually used to fire at the angels, which I thought was a lot of fun. It is fun. It's not relevant to today's story at all, or indeed today's comparison, but I thought worth touching on when I found it. So, the story of Paradise Lost, from a quick summary from what I read months or even years ago, starts with Satan, or Lucifer, waking up in hell and the demons gathering. Interestingly, Jupiter and Saturn, from what I understand, or Zeus and Kronos for us, are actually among the demons mentioned in Book 1, so they all gather and a sort of list goes on of the who's who of the demon world, and among them we have quite a few of our past and future friends, the Greek gods, Okay. which I thought was interesting. In Book 2 of Paradise Lost, Satan shatters the peace in heaven, and a third of heaven's angels follow him. They're then banished from heaven and are ascribed never-ending torment, apparently, according to the text. Okay, let's do a comparison. I thought that might be interesting. Do a comparison of the information in Paradise Lost, and at the end you can think, is the Titanomachy all that similar to Paradise Lost, and is this comparison justified? With that, let's get into the Titanomachy, and what actually happens. Now, as we covered last week, Kronos eventually learns that Zeus still exists. And he's probably not really happy about that. No, he immediately tried to hatch a plot to get rid of him. Because as we learned last time, there's a prophecy that says the kid will overthrow the father. Yep, and as we know, you can always escape prophecies 100% of the time, don't worry about it at all. However, before he can do anything to put a plan into motion, Zeus overthrows him. Just like the prophecy said. Bringing it about in one go. However, there is a contrast between different versions, whether this overthrow happens immediately or if it's over a longer term. So I'll be going through the different sources one by one to give you a flavour of what each one actually says. The version from Gwerber is the short version, and we'll be going through that first. Do you remember the 1920s Greek myths collection? Mm -hmm. We'll be going through that version first, and then switching over to Apollodorus and some other versions just to get an idea. Now, the 1920s Greek text has Zeus immediately overthrowing his father, and as with Kronos, Zeus gives his siblings a fair share of power. The four cleverest titans submit without complaint, and these are Memnosyne, Hyperion, Themis, and Oceanus. You may remember these names in passing from last week. I do. However, the other titans don't really care for this regime change, and a fight starts. Zeus recognises from his base on Olympus that there are too many opponents for him to handle, and he needs an extra edge. So he then frees the Cyclopes, remember, the one-eyed siblings of the Titans, yeah. stating that he needs Thunderbolts in return for their freedom. 
Yeah, they're the one who gave him the thunderbolt. Yep, so in this version, he asks it as a kind of quid pro quo, saying, well, I freed you, I need something. So but only... did it even want to be freed? I assume so. The, the script, from what I understand, I haven't read any actual descriptions, Tartarus is not a fun place to be. So w w which one was the one who didn't want to be freed then last time? I don't think any of them didn't want to be freed. They were hesitant at go rebelling against Oranos. But the Cyclopes were the only ones who knew how to make the Thunderbolt, so it makes some sense that Zeus would ask this as a kind of quid pro quo. You scratch my back and I'll smite your enemies with Thunderbolts. These new weapons, the Thunderbolts, terrify the Titans, but they rallied. And apparently the fighting took place in Thessaly, which is a region of Greece. Yeah. Which makes sense, given that it's a Greek mythology story. And supposedly the gods stacked mountains to try and reach Olympus. Or at least that's what the ancient Greeks thought. So piling mountains on top of another in the hope to actually reach Zeus on the summit of Olympus. <laughs> this fighting carried on for a decade, but eventually the Titans were defeated. There's an uncertainty in the text, or at least something that I didn't really fully understand, but I think that Poseidon guards them while they were thrown into Tartarus. Or at least for a bit. The wording says he makes them secure, and it's a little unclear. He guards who? So the wording of the text is a little unclear, but it seems Poseidon guarded the Titans after they're thrown into Tartarus, or at least for a little bit. I won't go into the specific wording of the text, but it's a little unclear. Well, making them secure could mean that he's making sure that they're very well locked up. Yep, that's true, I suppose. He could have been their jailkeeper as well. Yep. But anyway, he, he's involved at some point and then goes off to do other things. Yeah, he's busy, he's a god. Now, this version says that Kronos went to Italy after becoming tired of the fighting and founded a kingdom there, which, it doesn't really come back to this in any detail, but I think it's brilliant. <laughs> kind of like the equivalent of a retirement home. Yeah, he just went like, okay, just, okay, you may as well have it, bye. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that's one version, the version of the collected Greek myths from the 1920s. But what does our friend Apollodorus say? Well, once Zeus was an adult, he asked the nymph Metis to help him. You remember Metis from last time, his cousin? Mm -hmm. Now, she gave Kronos a concoction which made him vomit up his other children, as we discussed last time. Now, in this version, Kronos and his titans battle against Zeus and his siblings, so there isn't the theme of first overthrowing him and then a war, there's just an immediate war. All right. Now again, they fight for a decade, and during this fighting, Menoetius is hit by a thunderbolt and sent to Tartarus. Menoetius is the child of Iapetus and is the brother of Prometheus and Epimetheus, mm -hmm. and also of Atlas, who is most famous today as being the origin of the word Atlas. Okay. Now, Menoetius was supposedly killed by this thunderbolt and flung down to Tartarus, although one text calls it Erebus, because he was proud and presuming. And the author Stephen Fry, in his retelling Mythos, notes it was one of the very first bolts, maybe a prototype. Yeah. You have the honour of being the first one smitten by this thunderbolt, so please leave a review. In that version, they don't explain where the thunderbolt comes from? They will do in a second, and they will go into even more detail, actually. In both versions, the Cyclopes do give him the thunderbolts. The difference is more what actually starts the war. Is it okay. Zeus overthrowing him, or just Zeus reappearing? There's another fascinating detail about Prometheus and his family, which I found and felt I had to include because we'll probably never come back to it again. Prometheus and Menoetius' father, Iapetus, is supposedly married to Oceanus' daughter, Clymene, and one text specifically mentions how pretty her ankles are. Okay, why are ankles? I find this brilliant. I've seen this before when I listened to a retelling of the Odyssey, which we'll get to in a later episode, where I think Menelaus has attention drawn to how pretty his feet are. There seems to be at least a minor theme in Greek mythological retellings. I mean, ankles are beautiful. Yeah, apparently Clymene's ones were quite something. <laughs> anyway, so a goddess called Styx and her kids fought against the Titans and with Zeus, and he rewarded her after the fighting by saying that any oath would be sworn on the river Styx, so her namesake. Apparently, Gaia told her grandson in a prophecy... He of course, we, we have so many of those. You remember from last time I said that Gaia's role at some point becomes just giving out prophecies? Mm -hmm. Well, this is part of why I said that. So, in a prophecy, she told her grandson he would win if he freed his uncles still locked in Tartarus. And we know those prophecies are completely 100% sure. Yep. So, Zeus then freed the Centimani and the Cyclopes, the six other children of Gaia and Uranos. He did this by bursting in, killing Campy, who guarded them, and cutting their chains. The Cyclopes, in return, gave Zeus lightning and thunder, but they also had some other gifts for some of the other brothers. Oh, they did! So Poseidon's trident was also a gift from the Cyclopes, as were the helmet of Hades. That's so everyone nice. gets an upgrade. 
With these gifts, the gods then won against the Titans, and the Titans were then locked away in Tartarus, and the Centimani acted as their guards. One thing I did think is, is this really that much better than being locked in Tartarus? Yes, you're guarding the Titans who are now locked in themselves, but you are still down there in Tartarus. So the Centimani are now the guardians of the Titans, but they are still in Tartarus, just this time in their position as jail keepers. So it doesn't seem so like that much better. Was part of the one Jews freed. Yes, they were the hunt the ones but with But now they're just jailer. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't sound like the best of deals. No, it's better, but not that much better, it seems to me. Anyway, before we finish, let's add some more details from different versions here. So we've had the Greek myths and we've had Apollodorus, let's sprinkle some others in there. Mm -hmm. Now, Prometheus and his mother, who is either listed as Themis or Clymene, fight with Zeus. And Hyginus, or, who I haven't accessed yet, but I've only read a secondary source here, says that Hera later encouraged the Titans to rise up against Zeus, being unhappy that Epaphus, one of Zeus's illegitimate children, was given a kingdom as powerful as Egypt to rule over. And the aim of this was to put Kronos back on the throne. Okay. With the help of his children, Apollo, Artemis, and Athena, Zeus flung them back into the underworld when they tried to climb to Olympus. This rebellion was led by Atlas, who was also the son of Iapetus, and Zeus set him up to hold the sky up on his shoulders as a punishment, so this is where that comes from. Okay. The main point of all of this is, we've now got Zeus and his siblings in charge. They drew lots for who ruled what. I like to imagine this was names from a hat. In terms of who got what section of the cosmos. So we put all their names into little right? and say, okay, well, you have that, you have that, you have that. Exactly. So Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades all go in a big bowl and they rummage around to see who gets what. Hades became ruler of the underworld, and Apollodorus, as I've read him, also calls this Hades, which feels a little bit on the nose. Poseidon was given the sea. Yep, Poseidon comes ruler of the sea, and Zeus became master of the sky. And there's one retelling of this story that I've seen by overly sarcastic productions over on YouTube, which have Hades whispering that he, why couldn't we have done this by primogeniture? Because after all, he is the oldest child. So he's probably thinking, I've lost out a little bit. Yeah. The Iliad also says that Zeus, Poseidon and Hades divided the world amongst themselves, with the earth being common ground with the exception of personal intervention by any of the three. What do they mean by that? I think what that means is, if one of them intervenes, they can do whatever they like, you know, their actions won't be acted against, but the Earth is not, in principle, something that belongs to any one of them. Yeah. Now, again, I haven't looked into the Iliad, I've just seen a secondary summary of this, because I don't I want to go... I the Iliad. Yeah, we will discuss it together. Nice. The point is, I just didn't want to go down the Iliad rabbit hole today, because that's really not what we're talking about. <laughs> it's a very long thing. I imagine it's going to be a very long read, and it will take, probably take several episodes to get through. But as we did last week, let's now draw some parallels between this story and another from a different mythology, Norse mythology as per the Poetic Edda. Here, the very first war was between the Vanir and the gods. Well, this whole story is mentioned in stanza 21 of the Völuspá, when the world is created. The Vanir are mentioned as being inferior to the Aesir, and they are gods in charge of things such as riches and trade. In the story, the Aesir torture Gulveig, a goddess, and in reparation, the Vanir ask to be paid or recognised as equals of the Aesir. The Aesir immediately refuse and declare war. That checks out. They were beaten a lot before all gods were declared equals, and a bit of a deep dive into this story is the gods held a debate after the war to decide whether all the gods were equal or whether the losers became the tributaries of the winners. They just ended up going with the former. After the war, the Vanir called Freya and Njord go to live with the Aesir, and Mimir and Hoenir go to live with the Vanir. And I imagine this kind of as a hostage swap, you know, sending people back and forth to ensure that we keep peace. Yeah. As a ritualistic piece, both sets of gods mixed their joint spit into a bowl, and Kvasir, a poetry god, was born from this. That's disgusting. It also seems surprising there's a god of poetry who emerges from that. <laughs> You'd think one of hygiene would be more appropriate. Or oh, the cellular god. That too. <laughs> The Vanir, in the course of the war, destroy Asgard, and so it's built back up afterwards, and a giant is hired to rebuild it, but asks to marry Freya in return, as well as getting the sun and moon. Freya's the queen. Yes. There is more story to this, however, this is not a Norse mythology podcast, as I must keep reminding myself, so we'll move on. As a final thought for today, Zeus thought he would have some peace and quiet, now that he'd stolen the kingship off his father. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Your hunch is right. Gaia was angry at Zeus for usurping her children. And she made a huge beast by the name of Typhon, which she essentially sicked on Zeus. 
We might get into that story next time. However, given that the story of Typhon does include some people who we'll have to cover in later episodes, such as the other Olympians, Artemis, Hephaestus, and also Leto, we'll have to see whether this actually ends up being the next episode or not. It probably will be, because you probably don't have to cover the myths in order, but we'll see. I'm excited about it either way. Yeah, I'll straighten all of that out once I get into the sources a little bit more, because I've only seen the Wikipedia for Typhon so far to say who's actually mentioned in the story. There are people like Pindar who I can probably read in more detail. Okay, sounds good. With that, that brings us to the end of our episode. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed. We really do. Mythology is great. Mythology is great. But it's pretty crazy. When I've been looking at those trees, I'm trying to